Open your Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 17. 1 Samuel, chapter number 17. I'd like to read this entire chapter. In fact, I'd like to go back into chapter 16, but uh, we're not going to take time to do that. So, verse 48. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the enemy to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took hence a stone and slung it and smote the Philistine in the forehead that the stone sunk into the forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him and there was no sword in the hand of David." I did something this last week that I haven't done in a long, long time. I really don't know why, but uh, I got to thinking about the story of David and Goliath. Uh, I don't know what really got it started, but I, I simply could not stop and, and really had no intention of preaching the message on it this week because... Uh, as I said this morning, originally I had intended on preaching a message this morning entitled Come to Jesus, and then uh, tonight I was going to preach about come, uh, the, the coming of Jesus. And uh, so anyway, the Lord turned that all around, and, and still I haven't been able to get this off of my heart. And so it just simply reminded me of this, and that is that we need to give more thought to things that we're already familiar with. You know, there's a good reason why this story and others like it are so popular. It's because they're profitable. One old preacher, in fact, in my in my Bible that uh, got lost in the flood and or destroyed in the flood, I, I had copied down there, and I can't remember who the quote was from, but it was probably 150 years old, an old preacher that said whenever the path to the well is well worn, you know the water is good. And that's kind of the way it is when we think about all of those uh, various verses of the Bible that are so popular. Uh, James Hastings wrote a 20-volume set of books years ago uh, about all the popular texts of the Bible and so forth. And... Uh, so there's a lot to be said about that. And we can all think about certain stories in the Bible that we're very familiar with. And sometimes we get the idea, uh, that, you know, that's for kids. But it's more than that, oh, amen. you see. And, and here's a story that we're all familiar with, the story of David and Goliath. But I really think sometimes we miss the point, uh, you know, because the real battle is between Goliath and God. You know, <laughs> that's laughable to call that a battle, by the way. Yeah, but uh, there's a conflict between Goliath and God, but it doesn't rule out the fact that David was involved from the get-go. And uh, whenever you look at the look at the... The beginning, it seems like, wow, David doesn't stand a chance. Now, because you're familiar with this story, I'm not going back and try to read every verse related to it tonight, but I'll mention just a few things. But whenever you look at Goliath and what was in his favor, you know, you can kind of wrap it up, I think, by saying it's he had in his favor all of those things that are so highly prized by, uh, by people today. Uh, men, especially, certainly men in conflict, he had size. Verse 4 says his height was six cubits and a span. That's like nine feet, nine inches tall. I mean, you talk about a big, bad bully. I mean, nine feet, nine inches tall. So he has the size and he had the strength because whenever you read about all of the different equipment, you know, that, that it, it mentions here, 
Some have estimated anywhere from 150 to I saw one writer estimated it might have been 300 pounds worth of equipment he had to carry. Now, if you've got to carry that much equipment into battle while the battle's going on, you've got to be mighty strong to do that. And then there is the military equipment in his possession. You know, we look at these things, the sword and the shield and the armor and all of that, and we don't think you know, about that being so great, but that was the high-tech stuff back in that day. Now, not everybody possessed uh, body armor like they had. And so he has the very finest equipment that is possible, and you have to ask yourself, what in the world is a little shepherd boy going to do against something like that? But then there's something else that generally gets overlooked in this whole thing, and that's he had fame. This man was a national hero. He was their pride and their joy. And the Philistines have have proposed a contest between them and Israel, and in this case between, uh, you know, uh, one-on-one winner-takes-all kind of a contest. And so you can imagine all of the cheers for for Goliath. This is the man that they sent into battle. So you can say... He has the home court advantage, and sometimes that's big. I mean, he is out there on the battlefield, and he knows everybody, everybody uh, is for him. He has fame. He has all of the qualities that you would think would make him a winner. But now in the other corner... You know, I can just see, you know, the old ring announcer pulling down that microphone. And now in the other corner, we have David. (laughs) David, a little scrawny shepherd boy. And at this time, he's actually serving as a grocery boy. Can you imagine that? I mean, that really, that's what he was doing. He was taking food to his brothers out there. And so he's worried. It's kind of like, you know... uh, going down to Kroger and finding some kid, you know, going out there getting the shopping carts and stuff like that and putting him against one of those cage fighters. Yeah, I mean, you know from the beginning he's not going to stand a chance. So here's a little old David, and uh, you just can't imagine anything good coming out of this. Many years ago, I run across Romans 15, 4, which really, really got a hold of my heart. And it's talking about the things that, that were written. Talking about basically the Old Testament, the things that were written. And he tells us that all of these things were written that we might have hope. In other words, every story, you see, God didn't even touch the hem of the garment when it come to all of the stuff that He could have recorded. Uh, That's true just in the life of Jesus Christ Himself because, you know, the Bible says the whole world couldn't contain all of the stuff that could be written about Him, you know, if, if it was all recorded. And so it's not. And you think about all of the stuff throughout history that God could have told us about. But God selected, God handpicked certain stories in history, and He did so, as He said, that we might have hope. So when we look at this story tonight, the thing that I want each one of us to take away from here is that there is hope. And I say that because we all have giants to face. We live in the land of giants, in fact. You know, they go by many different names. There's the giant of sin. Everybody has to contend with that. Most folks don't win over over that either, by the way. Then there's the sin of guilt. What a horrible, powerful enemy that is. Guilt. I mean, there's nothing in this world that will just take the shout out of you that will, you know, steal your joy and make you miserable more than than the, the guilt of sin. There's the shame. There's the fear. There's the giant of pride. Wow. The giant of anger, resentment, discouragement, depression, doubt, all of these different giants that we have to contend with. And what we learn from history is this. There is a way to win. 
There's a way to win. That, that is so encouraging to me. And as I was reading this story this last week and thinking about it, because a lot of times, you know, when we're facing these different giants that I've just mentioned, we get the feeling that there's no way to win. There's no way out of this. That I'm going to, I, you know, I'm going to be enslaved to this particular sin for the rest of my life, or I'm going to be troubled by pride, or I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to be defeated by depression all of my life, and there's not anything I can do about it. But whenever I look at stories like this, it just reminds me that God is telling me there is a way to win. There's a reason that we can have hope regardless of what the giant is. But for that to happen, we have to face, we have to face the giant. We have to fight against the giant and finish the giant. And when we look at David, I, you know, I've often thought, man, what guts it took for a little kid like that to go into battle against Goliath. It took guts. But David had more than guts. David had God. And a better way to say it is God had David. Because it's not like David using God as an instrument it's God using David as an instrument, you see. And let me tell you, God is greater than any giant that you'll ever face. You'll never have a need He can't meet. You'll never have a problem He can't solve. And regardless of what you're going through, there's reason for you to hope. So let's just for a few minutes consider this story. Now remember... David has already killed a lion and a bear. And now he's about to face Goliath. And uh, one of the things that we sometimes forget is before he could face Goliath, he first of all had to contend with his own brothers. Now remember, he brought them lunch. And he sees the giant over there taunting the children of Israel and David is mystified as to why is it nobody's gone out. You know, that, that guy is, is blaspheming the name of our great God. Why is nobody going out against him? And, you know, like David says, nobody's going to go. I'll do it. I mean, they're laughing him, to, you know, to scorn. I mean, he's, he has got to face them. And as I thought about it this week, I thought, you know, note to self, I can't let what others think determine what I do. Amen. I was sitting there a while ago and I was thinking about that very thing, you know. I can't let what others, th others think determine what I do. And when God called me to preach, I've often, you know, wondered what would have happened if I had gone to my co-workers and said uh, to them, well, I've decided I'm gonna I'm gonna be a preacher. They look, they would have thought I was drunk or I had lost my mind. Or if I could have gone back and talked to talked to some of my classmates in high school and said, Guess what? I've decided to become a preacher. Uh, they would, you know, they would have really known something was wrong because there's not one of those people that would have believed any such thing like that. And, and you know, if I'd sat down and said, "Look, I need to consult with you a little bit. What do you think? You know, for for some reason, I've got this desire to uh, to be a preacher. You know, I'm not sure where it come from. Maybe God gave it to me. I don't know. But I just got this desire to become a preacher. What do you think? You think I ought to give it a try? You, I'm glad I didn't ask any of those folks because I didn't have any doubt about what it was that God wanted me to do. I didn't need to consult with someone else. What do you think I ought to do? Well, God is the one that directs our steps. Next, though, David had to convince the king, King Saul. <sighs> well, it goes from bad to worse. It's one thing, you know, to... Talk down your brothers is another thing. He's got to get permission from the king to be the representative of Israel to go out against the giant. So he goes before King Saul, and, and in doing so, he again, he recalls the victory over the lion and the bear. 
You see, David believed that God was the same regardless of who the enemy was. doesn't make any difference what enemy you're facing. You know, go back whenever I was talking about, you know, sin, guilt, shame, fear, pride, anger, all of those things. doesn't make any difference which problem it is. God is still the same. You know, and the same God that can meet one need can meet all of the needs. And David was right, and it's as though David is saying to Saul, you know, it's not about me, but, but it is about God. So, Saul grants David permission to be the representative. And that takes us to the next, the next phase of the, of the contest, and that is preparation. Because regardless of what it is that you know God wants you to do, there's always some preparation involved. And so now David has, you know, got the call to go to battle, but he needs to prepare himself. And first of all, he got rid of everything that hindered, you know, Saul, and I'm sure his intentions were good. Saul said, look, son, if you're, <laughs> if you're going out there against Goliath, you're going to need this and you're going to need that. And and I and I know you don't have any of your own, so I'm going to give you my armor. Now remember, Saul himself stood head and shoulders above everybody else in Israel. He was he was a big guy himself, you know. He may might have been seven foot tall. I don't know. He's a big guy, and now he gives David his armor, and I can just picture David standing there with that armor draped over him, weighting him down, and uh, so. David said, you know, I can't use this. He got rid of that, but even he even got rid of his sword. And in, in, in doing so, he has rejected Saul's advice, and he did something that seemed absolutely foolish to everybody else. Nobody else could, could understand why he's doing this and why he's going about it this way. I don't need any of those things. So he gets rid of anything that might hinder and you know, whenever we're going to get serious about serving God, that's one of the things we have to do. We have to get rid of the things that might hinder us. And I've said so many times before, you know, most of the time, most of the time, the thing that keeps us from the best is not something that is the worst, but it's something that is good. We get involved in something, for example, that in and of itself is not sinful. You know, it's good. Uh, in moderation, you know, it might even be helpful. But some way or another, we tend to let those things dominate us to the point that they hinder us. You know, for me, it was uh, basically, it was quail hunting and, and, and ball. Fast pitch softball, semi-pro baseball, it, it was that. I mean, that was... Uh, wow, well, that's, that's about all I did. Uh, somebody, Henry said the other day something about... That's outside and Kathy being able to hit a ball really well. And I said, well, she should. She was raised at the ballpark. I mean, uh, just nearly every night, Bev lugged those kids off to the ballpark and followed me all around. And, and, but the thing of it is, we had a church softball team. And at first I thought, okay, I can't play on the church softball team, keep getting involved in all of this other stuff. So I quit all of the other stuff that I enjoyed so much. And that was a real victory, but it got to the point that, I, look, when God called me to preach, is you know, I really don't have time for any of that. And all my life, I had wanted a really good quail dog, you know, and man, they're hard to find, let me tell you. And I finally, I finally had one, and lo and behold, I decided, you know, that, uh, well, if I'm going to get serious about serving God, I've got, I've got to sell my bird dog. And I did. Now, that doesn't mean I've succeeded in everything that I've tried, but I'm just trying to illustrate that any time that we're going to set out to do something for God, there's a price to pay, and we have to get rid of things that are going to hinder us. And so David said, look, can't use any of that stuff. It's just going to get in the way. Secondly, secondly, David took what he was familiar with and no more. Look at verse number 40. Verse number 40. 
And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even a script, and his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. Now this is something he was familiar with. He didn't have a 30 alt 6 uh, he, he, you know, he, he didn't even have a billy club or a lot of other kind of weapons, but he, he was familiar with a sling. And so he got five smooth stones and took his sling and off he went. In other words, he used that which had worked before. You know, a lot of times I think as churches get themselves in trouble always thinking, you know, we've got to come up with something new. You know, and, and, and I believe me, I understand how pastors think when nothing is happening and the church isn't growing and the attendance is dwindling and it seems like everybody is stuck on board and and you get to thinking, well, you know, the church over there across town, I noticed... They've really been growing, man. They've doubled in size over the last few years, and maybe maybe we need to try some of their tricks. So, you know, we'll try this new program and that new program. You know, I, I, I just got to believe we're better off with sticking with what we know works, and that's the preaching and teaching of the Word of God and prayer and, and those things that have been working ever since the New Testament was written, that it, look, it worked back then. Picture those early saints in the catacombs. There are people hiding for their lives. They don't have a piano. They don't have an organ. They don't have any of the musical instruments. They don't have the sound equipment. They don't have the padded seats. They don't have any of those things. They're in a cold, dark, damp cave somewhere hiding and yet, the Bible speaks of, of the way that God used those people, those early saints. They literally shook the world without any of the stuff that we consider to be absolutely necessary. And the reason they were so effective is because they used those things that had been ordained of God in the Bible you say, well, what's that? Well, read Ephesians chapter number 6 and take the whole armor of God. If you want to know what you need to win the battle, it's all listed there in the armor of God. You see, God equips us with exactly what we need. Then number three, it's noteworthy that He took faith into the fight. Look, look back at verse number 37 for just a moment. Verse 37 David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the jaw paw of the bear, he will. Notice, he didn't say he might. He says he will. That's emphatic. He will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And then you look on over to verse number 45, talking about, you know, it's one thing to take equipment into the fight. It's another thing to take faith into the fight. And here in verse number 45, Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with the sword and with the spear, and with the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defiled. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand. Boy, you read that, and I'm telling you what, there's absolutely no doubt in David's mind about who's going to win. You know, I can, I can just picture maybe some of the, the Israelites, maybe his brothers, patting him on the back saying, Brother, <laughs> we're, we're rooting for you. We're praying for you. We're hoping some way you can come up with a plan to defeat that big ugly giant, you know, I, I, you know, I, I can just picture them trying to root him on to victory. But the one thing more than anything that, that helped David was having the faith to believe that if God was sending him into the fight, that he was going to be victorious against the enemy. Where do we get that kind of faith? Romans ten seventeen, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. Now listen carefully. David knew he would be victorious 
because David had already been anointed to be the next king of Israel. Go back to chapter number 16 and verse 10 through verse 13. And there we read it. Where David has been anointed of God. You remember when all of the brothers came in, you know, they were all brought in and each one examined and finally, you know, all of them's rejected and Samuel said, you know, hey, don't you have any of us? Well, we got this little one little shepherd boy out there. I mean, he's a little scrawny kid. And, well, where's he at? Well, they bring him in and boy, just like that, the old prophet says, that's him. That's him. <laughs> And he was anointed as king. Now look, you see, David knew he couldn't fail in this fight because if he lost this fight, if the the giant killed David, God's promise could not have been fulfilled. You see, that's why we can have strong faith. Our faith isn't based upon what we think that we have the ability to do. It's not based upon our determination. It's not based upon, you know, how good we feel about ourselves or how smart we think we are. Faith is based upon God and the promises that God has made. And we all can have that kind of confidence. So in David's mind, now get this, in David's mind, Goliath is already dead. They haven't even come together. The fight hasn't even taken place. But in the mind of David, he's already dead. Why? How do you know? Well, because God promised I'm going to be the next king. I'm going into battle. I can't lose. I mean, he's already dead. So he has no fear in what he's facing. Now, I want to wrap all of this up very briefly. And and I, I just want you to notice... Now, we're going to comment a lot on it, but I just want you to notice the kind of person that God uses. The kind of person God uses. God uses common people. Mm-hmm. You know, God, uh, God could have uh, looked upon this situation. He could have tapped Saul on the shoulder and said, Do you realize what a horrible situation you're in? If you folks don't get the victory in this, it's going to be horrible for generations to come. They're going to enslave you and abuse you. So think about it. She said, "All right, well, we we got to we got to do a search. We got to." We got to go out here and find somebody that's, you know, the most talented person in the world. We'll have some tryouts. How about that? We'll have some tryouts. We'll have a tournament to see who comes out on top and we'll send him over to fight the giant. Instead of that, God just used a common person, common person, a shepherd boy, a common person. There's so many times, you know, we think we can't be of any great use to God unless yeah, we've got our list of qualifications here, you know. Well, we can't really do much for God because I've never been to seminary. I've never been to Bible college. I've never done this and I've never done that. You know, just, just be who you are. Just be who you are. Well, you say, yeah, but God never called me to preach. Good. If He didn't call you to preach, it'd be a horrible thing if you surrendered to preach. He really would. Because, look, God doesn't, doesn't need every member of the church to be a preacher in the sense of, you know, being a pastor. He doesn't need that. We need to each one excel at what God's called us to do and thank God for that. And God uses common people. But he also used people that are consecrated and them but that that word consecrated has to do with being set apart, being, you know, used in a specific way. People that are committed to God. It takes commitment if we want God to use us. We have to be committed to it. But we can't go into it half hearted. Well, you know, yeah, oh yeah, I'll give it a try. Uh, yeah, I'll try to see a few weeks and see how it works out, see if I like it or not. Well, if that's going to be the criteria by which you just make your, 
your choice. Just forget it. We've got to be committed to what we know God has called us to do. And then in the midst of all that, God uses people that are cautious. You know, David, from the very get-go, as soon as he talked to the brothers, he said, none of you going to go out and fight that big guy? And they said, no. David could have said, I'll go. He could have just taken off. He could have ignored Saul, went out without any authority whatsoever, just ignored preparing himself, no, oh, I, I don't. I don't even need my sling. I don't need anything. I'll go up there and I'll take him on. Now, David was more cautious than that. You know, the Bible talks about us. You know, uh, walking like uh, like a cat. You know, that's walking across the uh, top of a rail fence or something. And, you know, we've got to be cautious in every step we take. We can't be scatterbrained and just doing whatever we feel that we want to do. We've got to be cautious in that we allow God to guide us. And then God uses people that are courageous. And boy, when I look at this story of David, I, I see courage written all over it. Well, courage, but and we all need courage, don't we? For whatever giant it is that we're facing, we need courage. And that courage comes from, again, going back to the matter of faith. We overcome our fears. We can't eliminate our fears. I've read the testimony of so many different soldiers. I'm talking about heroes in the military and what have you. And people talk about the fact how fearless they were. They'll tell you in a heartbeat that, you know, that's no truth to that at all. You, you're not out there without fear. The fear never goes away. It's there all the time. It's a matter of overcoming that fear. And the way we overcome our fears is what? It's by faith. A faith that is rooted and grounded in the Word of God. So when you leave here tonight, I want you to leave here going away saying to yourself, because I don't know what giant you might be facing, but I want you to leave here saying to yourself, there's a way to win. There is a way to win. God's bigger than your giant. Let's pray. Father, how we thank you tonight for your loving kindness. How we thank you, Lord, for these stories that you've recorded throughout the Bible that, that indeed inspires hope within us. And so many times that maybe, maybe we just get in a pit of despair over our own failures. It might not be depression over the failures of others. Maybe we conquer that. May we determine to go on and do what's right regardless of the condition of the world. But then just because we ourselves fail so miserably and we're eaten up with shame and guilt and, and sometimes we just don't feel like we ought to even go on or keep trying. And Lord, if somebody's going through anything like that tonight, I pray you'll encourage them with the, with the strength of your word. Help them to leave here tonight knowing that they don't have to be a loser. They can be a winner because in Christ, we're more than conquerors. So bless us tonight. We don't deserve anything, but we sure need it. And we're asking it in Jesus' name. Amen. While we stand and we're going to sing a verse.